What's the role of fracture and the interaction between fracture and fluids that circulate within fractures in driving carbonate diagenesis during burial? So I have a confession to make. You are in one of my favorite locations, one of my favorite outcrops. This is Jebel Madar, and it is effectively a soul dome, and we're basically standing on a carbonate carapace on top of this soul dome. The salt itself is Precambrian in age, or Neoproterozoic in age. We've already talked about it in a, in a previous uh, course. And the rock around us range from Jurassic, the very oldest rock that we see, all the way to early Cretaceous. But What's more important is the fact that we see a network of large fracture on top of that soul dome that you can see here with a triple junction in the middle. And not only are, do we have these big fracture that form valleys in valley in which I'm standing right now, but we also have smaller fracture. And what's inside the fracture is absolutely wonderful. If you look behind me, the fractures are filled with crystallization. We have crystals of calcite, but we also have crystals of barite. And the reason we have this mineralization in the fracture is because we had fluid circulation. So there is an intimate link between fractures and fluid circulation, and by extension between fracture and diagenesis in carbonate successions. And that's what we're going to explore in this class. So fractures are not unique to Oman and to Jebel Madar. In fact, you find them everywhere. And I want to bring you back to a location you are very familiar with now, which is the Guadalupian of Texas, to look at the relationship between fractures there and sequence stratigraphy, but also diagenesis. So if we look at the Guadalupian reef and the back reef, remember that we said we have this reef that is a little deeper in the depositional setting. And behind it, we have the fall-in beds. Well, there's an implication for this fall-in beds. It implies that the geometry of the back reef is not flat. The, the, the back reef is actually steepening towards the reef. The other thing that's interesting to observe at the outcrop in Texas is the fact that we have cavities in the reef that are filled by sediments. But this infilling by sediment indicates, because we can look at the surface as a geopetal, indicates that blocks of the reef have rotated at time of deposition. It's since sedimentary because we find sediment inside the cavity. We have other indication that fractures were early. So if we look at this picture here, we are, we are in the reef. The top is indicated by an arrow. And if we look closely, you can see a separation between two lithologies. And what separates these two lithologies is a fracture. We have a fracture here in the reef. We know it's the reef because on the side, we find these typical reef facies with sponges. We are familiar with the Guadalupe Guadalupian reef by that point. But inside the fracture, what we find is fascinating. It's basically a marine sediment, but a, a deep marine sediment. It's not a refill facies. So that sediment were, was deposited after the reef facies and represents a marine uh, infilling of a fracture. And that's known as a Neptunian dike. And it indicates that those fractures on the reef were early and were open to the seafloor so that sediments could come in. So early fracture in this reef, early burial diagenesis, what are the implications? Well, if you look at the back reef now, in the back reef, if you map the back, back reef, and that was done uh, by um, Kosa and Hunt, you find evidence for different fracture that are enlarged by dissolution. So effectively, because we have early fracture and we know that we have exposure to meteoric diagenesis, meteoric condition, these fractures are used by meteoric fluid during low stand, and we have karstification along those fracture in the Permian Basin of North America. So how does, does this system work and why do we have so many fracture in the back reef? So imagine now that you have a prograding system. Here you have the back reef, 
At the front, you have the reef, and then you have the, the fore reef, of course. The reef is a bit deeper than, uh, than the back reef. And in the basin, we have mud stone and wax stone. Now, this is a prograding system, as we know. And as it prograds, it essentially puts weight, the weight of the reef, on top of the mud. Now, the reef is cemented, which means that it will not compact because cemented rocks will not easily compact, but the muds are not compacted. So as you put the weight of the reef on top of the mud, you have differential compaction taking place. The muds get compacted more than the reef. And if you keep doing this, essentially that generates rotation of the reef block because of differential compaction and opening of early fractures behind the reef to accommodate for that compaction in. And this, these fractures are actually quite complex. Here I'm showing you an example of um, the Walnut Canyon that you're already familiar with. And you can see it looks like a mess, this outcrop because we have fractures and we have sands. And the point I want to make is that those fractures that are essentially karstic cavity during low stand when we are in wet conditions, then can be filled by silt and sand during the transgressive system track or when we are in arid conditions. So you end up with a very, very um, heterogeneous distribution of sand, uh, LST sand or, or TST sands, that are mixed with the karstic cavity and the deposits of silt. So that creates a lot of heterogeneity in your system. But that's not the end story for the fractures. They play a much bigger role in the system, as I will demonstrate. Because the fractures are localized close to the reef, they're not localized everywhere, you will find fracture corridors that are close, let's say maybe a kilometer or so, away from the reef front. Now remember that in the San Andreas Formation and in the Guadalupian, we have reflux dolomitization. So we have these, these saline water that come and essentially um, move along the sediments and dolomitize the sediments. Now what happens if when the, once this front of, uh, of dolomitization arrives, it encounters a, an early fracture? Well, the fracture is a super high permeability zone or super K zone. So essentially the fluids, rather than continue in the matrix, will basically be deviated and follow the direction of the fracture down. So that means that you're going to have windows of rock in front of those fractured corridors that will not be seeing much diagenetic fluid going through just because there is an easier pathway that avoids these rocks. So that actually contributes to the heterogeneity of the distribution of, of diagenetic product at the scale of the basin. And for the permanent basin, this model explains why there is a, an abundance of dolomite in the subsurface, but we see almost no dolomite when we look at the modern outcrops that we can visit. And the reason is that we're probably finding ourselves at the outcrop in a, in a situation where the fractures that were behind the outcrop window have essentially um, shunted the, or deviated those fluids away from the zone of dolomitization. So very important role here of fractures in essentially transporting fluids and guiding fluids in one part of the system or the other part of the system.